so I will be talking about this intersection between ecology and evolutionary dynamics for viruses. And so I want to start things off with the following picture. Actually, I do need the lights down a little bit. Well, just really for this picture and the next two, but no, I'll hold it for, for a few. So everyone knows this character, the most interesting man in the world, right? And there's a reason why I'm showing you this. First of all, because we already have our most interesting man in the world. He's not even here, which is really too bad. I worked really hard on trying to get this slide more than almost any other slide. But there's a really, uh, there's a reason why I'm showing you the most interesting man in the world in our, our version thereof, is because I also want to show you the most boring PowerPoint slide in the world. <laughs> so you probably have given such slides in lab group meetings, you're told do not do things like this, okay? It's very boring, there's just you know, replicas on the columns, experiments on the rows. This is so boring. But it's actually the most interesting table in the history of biology. I mean, that's an outrageous claim. It's an outrageous claim. But I'm, gonna, I'm trying to just get things started in the morning, and to some extent it's true. Okay. So I want to focus your attention just on one of the rows. And this is an experiment in which experimentalists went and took a bacterial culture, exposed it to something, and then these are the number, if you look across this row, these are the number of colonies that somehow made it, right? They counted this number of colonies. Who, yeah, most of the students, who has ever gotten an experiment like this? We got a bunch of zeros, a hundred, anyone? Like, just things are all over the place. Okay. And do you like showing this to your advisor, these sort of experiments? No. Okay. Does anyone want to speculate on where, I, but I'm claiming that this is the most interesting table in the history of, let's say, published biological sciences ever. Anyone want to guess? Students, anyone want to guess first? Submit. Delbrook experiment. Great. A lot of people are awake this morning. All right. So this is the table which I've turned around a little bit from Lurie and Delbrook, published in 1943, Mutations of Bacteria from Virus Sensitivity. So there's a reason I was getting to the viruses, virus sensitivity, the virus resistance. And the one that I wanted you to focus on was actually experiment number 16. I just remembered them where you have, these are the numbers of colonies that ended up becoming resistant to this viral attack. And most of the time, there are none, but sometimes there are very few, and sometimes, you know, just a very large number, 107. Okay, so the reason why I think this is the most interesting table in history of biological sciences, it's one of the reasons, maybe not the only, certainly, one of the reasons why uh, Murray and Delbrook, along with Chase, won a Nobel Prize in 1969. And if you understand this table, you understand quite a lot about both experimental design, but also the basis of mutation. So I just want to go through it very quickly. The idea at the time was that there were two different modes of possibility for the nature of mutations. One, it could be acquired directly as a result of the selective pressure of interaction, and the other, it could be independent of the selective pressure. And the notion of the acquired hypothesis that you grew this population through a series of doublings, exposed it to a population of viruses, and then some of those that were exposed and interacted with viruses survived, and so you would get a few resistant cells. Right? But the distribution of resistant cells should be Poisson, meaning there's a few, but there'll be a few in all of my replicates, sometimes five, six, seven, one. It'll be Poisson statistics where you have essentially a small variance relative to the mean. The alternative is that you grow up this population, and then independently of selection, there'll be a, resist, a mutation to resistance, and then all of the descendants, ignoring uh, reverse mutations, of that now mutated bacteria were themselves resistant. So sometimes if that resistant mutation happened early enough, you could have many descendants that were already present right, in that final population, so that when you expose that population to viruses, all I'm saying here, this is almost extreme, this whole branch, right, all of these uh, bacterial cells were already had already pre previously acquired resistance to this virus. And so this is why, this is not, not always happened, right? So this is why when it does, it's sort of like going to the casino. You lose most of the time, but when you win, you can win big. Right? And so that's the notion. And so going back, this is why I claim this is this most interesting table in the history of biological sciences. Now, you know, you can argue with me, show me a different one. Um, but that was the notion underlying what Lurie and Delbert found. And so to sum up, this is that viruses impose this strong selective pressure, uh, that host mutations that confirm uh, resistance are beneficial, and therefore viruses really induced evolution. But 
But what about the viruses? Right? So the Lurin and Delbruck experiment stops there. So it's only interested in the nature of mutation. Is it uh, acquired or is it independent? So a little bit less well known, at least uh, to me, or at least until recently, is that a few years later, Luria decided to go back. He said, fine, we got these bacteria to evolve resistance to viruses, but can the viruses in turn evolve counter resistance? Can they acquire somehow a new ability to infect these previously resistant bacterial strains? Right? And the answer was yes. So here, just to go, this is the original figure now. I'm not claiming this is the most interesting figure in the history of biology. This is the figure from this paper on sensitivity relations between bacteria and viruses. The phage are squares. The bacteria are these sort of extended ovals. Started with E. coli B, and there was an alpha and a gamma strain. And the idea is that the dash lines denote the uh, direction of evolution, right? These are the descendants that now have some different properties in terms of infectivity. And so, yes, E. coli B can evolve into strains that are now potentially resistant to, uh, to alpha, but alpha prime can then evolve counter resistance to infect things that its ancestral wild type could not, right? There's no direct link between these two. And so this became a very important concept, right? That the host range of viruses can expand. So when we're talking about evolutionary dynamics, yes, we can evolve resistance very easily in the lab, but the viruses somehow can also evolve counter resistance. And there's two examples here, both between the alpha and alpha prime and the gamma and the gamma prime. But there's one uh, of these extended ovals, these bacterial types that is worth noting, is that in this experiment, a phage-resistant host strange emerges. I mean, they weren't able to take any of their viruses and somehow evolve a type that could itself infect this terminal bacterial type, which seemed to be resistant to all of the concurrent uh, phage in their experiment. This really became the dogma okay, for decades, that people thought it was very easy to evolve resistance, counter-resistance. You could do this a few times, but eventually the bacteria would win. And I think these are two of the best authorities on the topic. Rich Lenski, many of you know, uh, from his long-term E. coli experiments, he had previously started in Bruce Levin's lab uh, doing phage bacteria experiments, more on the evolutionary side, where, where Bruce Levin had do, done more on the population dynamic side. And this is, quoting from them, the co-evolutionary potential of virulent phage is less than that of their bacterial hosts. And this again and again is there are many examples in the early 80s, late 70s, where Experiments were done where, again, the bacteria seemed to terminate this co-evolutionary dynamics with a resistant type. And this was in the mid-80s, and I think this was also informed by the fact that people at the time didn't think that phage or viruses, in terms of viruses and microbes, and that's really what I'm talking about today, were altogether important in the environmental sense, meaning that you could use them in the lab, they were used for discoveries in molecular biology, but they weren't necessarily important in ecology or in environmental biology. So something happened. And the thing that happened is, I mean, it could have happened decades before, right? First of all, it's a question of numbers. How many phage or how many viruses, not necessarily phage, but any viruses or microbes were in a natural environment, right? And so this is an uh, electron micrograph from a paper by Berg et al. In, in Nature 1989. And it looks like, this is from lake water. It looks like you'd imagine things would look like in lake water, a little messy. Uh, the point here is that everything has been stained, so anything with DNA will appear here uh, in, in this sort of counter stain. And there are three arrows drawn in this figure. Here's a scale bar, one micron. These little dots are about 50 nanometers in diameter. And Berg et al.'s idea was that these were actually viruses. They formally speaking viruses like particles, but later you can show that, in fact, they're viruses. And they found over... 100 million virus particles per milliliter. And these are the sort of concentrations you get when you grow up a culture in the laboratory. And this is 1,000 to tens of million times higher than previous reports. The previous reports use culture-based methods. They said, okay, here's my target host. How many viruses can infect that host? But we don't know all the hosts. Right? So this was a direct counting technique. And people started to realize maybe that, that these viruses not only are, are, are co-evolving with their host, but they're actually a, 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 turning into very high numbers in natural environments. The other thing that happened after the mid-80s was people realized that the effects of viruses on hosts were not necessarily only deleterious. Of course, deleterious to the host that they, uh, they infected, targeted, and lice. But the organic matter that they released back into the environment could then be taken up by other hosts that weren't necessarily targeted by that specific strain. So in the late 90s, both by uh, Steve Wilhelm and Curtis Settle, as well as Jed Furman, proposed this idea of a viral shunt. 
that organic matter could be shunted away from higher trophic levels, meaning a bacteria or a microbe is not eaten by a zooplankton then going up the food chain, but the viruses could redirect that material back into the microbial loop, increasing, therefore, secondary productivity of microbes in the environment, and even primary productivity, as it turns out. And the last bit of the story that I think changed radically from the mid-80s is this notion of diversity. So just as metagenomics has started to be applied to the bacterial world, the unseen majority, the same happened with viruses. And in viruses, it was more extreme. These are sort of hits to things that were known, and most of the things were unknown. So there's this sort of biological dark matter that's sitting in viruses. And if you do these same pie charts, this is uh, work by Maya Breitbart with Horst Rauer and others in 2002, the same percentage, meaning 65, 70% of what you sequence for a viral metagenome, we still don't really have a good handle on the functional, uh, not even a close analog of what it could be from a functional perspective. Okay? So this has led to a number of people talking about this third age of phage or, of, in general, viruses of microbes. And I think it's encapsulated nicely in this book by Carl Zimmer. So if you want to read more about the diverse world of viruses that exist on this planet, you can get this done in, you know, maybe two hours, one evening. It's a very short, 50 book, around 100, 120 pages. So today I'll be talking really about two ways that I think that this sort of interplay between ecology and evolutionary dynamics with respect to uh, phage in particular. First of all, just who infects whom? So building upon this early work by Larry and Delbrook, and by Larry in particular, and it's been expanded by many, how can we think about who actually, what is the network of infections within a complex community? And then the other part has to do a little bit more with the ecological side, with what are the dynamics? What are the consequences of having something other than just a single virus and a single host in a community? Okay? And how that, those multi-type dynamics, in some sense evolutionary dynamics, actually affect ecology. So those are the two things I'm going to go through today. Who infects whom will be first? So as I said, there's this classic result that you have this ancestral wild-type virus that can infect uh, a host. A host revolves resistance to that, host, to that virus. You don't see the line connecting them. And then the virus evolves counter-resistance to the host. So now it has a host range expansion. It, it can infect the ancestral host as well as this newly evolved host. And you can imagine this process could repeat. But something else might happen. Maybe you have a different mutant in which the wild-type host now can infect it, but the newly evolved virus cannot. Right? Or a new mutant host that can't be infected by anyone. In fact, I think it just becomes a little bit more difficult once you get outside some of these very simple systems to have a very good expectation or hypothesis as to what exactly the structure might be. And this was really where we began a few years ago, back in around 2010, and one of the undergraduates in this department, uh, Lauren Farr, was, was key to collecting some of this data. Um, but we asked the question, what is the structure of phage bacteria infection networks? Can we update the data in some sense? And just to give you a sense of where the data comes from, that many uh, experimental, experimentalists, microbiologists, even environmental microbiologists, have collected panels of viruses and hosts. These are cultured versions, cultured isolates. And then done all the cross-infection assays, taken all their viruses and, and compared against all the hosts and said, who infects who? Who infects and lyses? And they use spot assays like this to see if they expose, essentially, a top bagger full with certain bacteria. And then they put these spots down. And then if the spots grow and make plaques, here there are none. So here, this type infects this bacteria. These both infect, whereas this type of phage does not, right? Because there's no either spots or no plaques. And so you can do this again and again. And soon you get what ends up looking like less interesting tables in biology, right, of pluses and minuses, which can be converted into this matrix format or a network. And the idea here is that blue background means no infection, and white means there is an infection. Okay? And it can be a bit of a mess. And part of the reason it can be a bit of a mess is that if you're looking for a pattern here, and I have 20 hosts and 20 viruses, there may be some structure, but it's not going to be evident in every visualization of it, right? Because I have a choice of how I present the data. So if I have 20 rows, I have 20 factorial number of ways of, of ordering them. Same with the columns. So I have just an enormous number of ways to look at this data. And it, therefore, it's not so surprising that people often collected them and said, look, there's diversity, there's differences but not so much was coming out. So what we did, and this is where Lauren Farr helped collect some of the primary data, and then this was analyzed predominantly by Cesar Flores, who was a recent PhD graduate in my group from physics. We went back to the literature and collected 38 studies that had been done over 25 or 30 years. This is the aggregation of all of them, same format as before, 
A lot of this is enterobacter and pterophage, some of it's cyanobacter and uh, cyanophage, some from experimental evolution studies, some from ecology. The notion was, could we see any salient patterns? And the reality was that the first time we collected all of this data, we weren't that hopeful. Right? It looked like a bit of a mess. Here you start to see something that looks like some ordered pattern, but a lot of it you know, kind of looks like this. And again, this goes back to the notion of the presentation of the data. I mean, we have to apply a systematic approach to actually organize and look for patterns. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time today published uh, of how you can look for these patterns. So I just want to tell you what one of the major patterns that emerged was. We can reorganize all of the same data, because it's up to us to decide it's the same cross-infection data. We just order it essentially from the uh, virus in the columns, which infects the most number of posts, we put that on the left. I mean, look, focus on 22 for a moment. And the virus that infects the fewest number we put on the right. And the host that is infected by the most, meaning the most susceptible host we put on the top, and the host that is most resistant to types we put on the bottom. And we do that for all the cases. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but that's about it. Uh, you can get almost the same thing. And what you start to see are patterns like this, where there seems to be a nestedness of infection, meaning the bacteria that's infected by the most types as it gets to become more resistant, it's dropping off those same viruses that are affecting those bacteria that are easiest to infect. Right? And so this is called nestedness. It turns out nestedness is very typical in these studies. And there's an interpretation that I'll give you in a moment. I just want to point out that what this is also able to do is identify patterns where your eye would not necessarily be able to see them. So this is an original data set, and this has been the same version when we try to look explicitly for nestedness. And it's very clear and also passes very statistical tests, that you can find this robust trend where essentially you have viruses on a spectrum from specialists to generalists and hosts from very susceptible to resistant types, and they go together. So I think that when people think about viruses, I certainly did when I started in, let's say, the theoretical side of theoretical ecology, that there's a notion of phage or viruses and microbes are highly specialized. There's one virus type for every host. Right, and I think this is the thing we often are told. In fact, they're named after the host that they infect, often, right? But this study, as well as a number of others, have shown there's another mode here of host range expansion, where there's this generalism that can happen on the phage side. You can really have a spectrum of infectivity as it becomes beneficial, presumably, for these viruses to be able to affect many types rather than just the one, and also the selective pressure for increasingly the host to become resistant to the types that previous hosts uh, we're susceptible to. So the conclusion of this first part is that there is a, a sense in which ecology affects evolution. Ecology, I mean, the selective pressure leads to changes in the number of types, and in fact, the identity of types in a community. And this broadening host range is one of those characteristic processes. But as a bridge to the next section, if you think carefully, let's say we had a community of these viruses and hosts, some of which were specialists, some were generalists, and vice versa for the, for the bacteria. How would they coexist? And I want to point out again in this matrix format, this host seems to be superior to all the others. I mean, it's, it's infected by virus type 5, but so is everyone else. Right. And likewise, why is this virus is outcompeted by everyone? It's specializing on host 5, but everyone also, all the other viruses also can infect host 5. Right. And so the answer to this question, at least in part, has to do with trade-offs. And again, this is, if you're interested, you can take a look. But you can have such communities of complex co-infection when one thinks about dynamics, given like history trade-offs. The, the characteristic of a virus is not just who it infects, but the rate at which it infects it. And the trade-off that may, may occur for having that new ability, right, that mutation may confer some decreased absorption rate, decreased birth size, maybe increased mortality because it starts to inject its DNA into just random bits of debris. So in this study, we propose one such way in which such complex networks might lead to coexistence. And the key here, though, is dynamics. And we have to think about these individual types as populations, not just as types, right, where they have a single connection to a host. So that's the second part of, of, of what I want to get to today. How do we, as theoretical ecologists, thinking about the microbial and viral world, think about dynamics? And so for that, I'm also going to step back a little bit in time. So these names are probably familiar to some of you if you've taken your ecology classes or they were at one point. Dino Volterra and Alfred Latka were two uh, mathematical biologists. Well, really, Alfred Latka was, uh, was a physical biologist of the turn of the century. 
and they independently developed what is now known as lockable uh, models of predator prey dynamics and consumer resource interactions. Vito Volterra, in particular, was convinced uh, by his son in law that there were these fluctuations in fisheries, which were very important in around World War I uh, in the Adriatic Sea, that could have been p uh, potentially a result of fishing, but Vito Volterra thought that perhaps something else was going on. There was something intrinsic to the interactions of the fish and the fish that ate them that might lead to natural fluctuations. And so they both, in a verbal model, if you read Vito Volterra's original paper, there are no equations in it, but he basically spells out what the equations should be. He's able to solve them. He presented the solutions he'd met at, at that time. And these are what you get. This is time, population, prey, and predator. You get these characteristic oscillations. And you, again, you've probably seen this in ecology classes. Well, first, the prey peaks. Right, the prey population peaks in abundance. And because there are many prey, the predators can increase. But because there are many predators, then the prey are starting to die faster. And as the prey decrease in abundance, now there's not that much for the predator to eat, and then the predator decreases in abundance. And these are, predator prey cycles are characteristic in which the prey peak is followed by the predator peak, and the prey trough is followed by the predator trough. Right? There's an ordering of these peaks in this, in this classic Lock and Voltaire system. In fact, many modifications always have this structure. There were some problems with that original model. Later models included true limit cycles, not things that there were some uh, fragile natures of the original proposal. And this is classic lynx hair data, where you should see that the uh, lynx peaks are following just a little bit after the hair peaks. And this is spanning around 50 years of, uh, of time series data, and there are other examples like this. Okay. And what's, the reason why I'm telling you all this about theoretical ecology from beginning with Lacan Volterra is that these same ideas were imported when the first models of virus host dynamics were proposed, first by Campbell in the 60s, then by Bruce Levin, who's uh, over at Emory, in the late 1970s with Frank Stewart, a mathematician, and Lin Chow, who's now, I think, chair at UCSD. This is work with Bohannon and Lenski a couple generations later. Population density, note the scale, time and hours, host population, virus population. And you see that characteristic shift where the host peak is followed, or at least you remember there's a resolution issue with this data, right? But it's at least coincident, or the virus peak just follows the host peak. So these look like classic predator prey peaks, even though the predator here is a parasite. But it's a virulent phage, so it infects, essentially consumes the host, kills it, releases more progeny. And so there are reasons why one would think exactly this might happen. Same experiment, but they just let it go. So this was fine. They let it go for 200 hours. And then they let it go for 400 more hours. And so I've just taken this data here is all compressed between 0 and 200. Same data set. Anyone have a speculation? What did they do at time 200? No one will speculate. So this is the same experiment. This is this chemostat, this virus and host. They're continuing to measure the same thing. Anyone will anyone speculate as to what they might have done at time 200, 200 hours? See, Shaw? Say again? So, maybe, so the answer is nothing because what you said happened. They didn't do anything. They just kept monitoring. And what happened was a resistance strain evolved. You don't see that here because they're measuring the total host and virus population. So that was their interpretation. What you have, though, is something called cryptic dynamics, meaning the host population is steady. The viruses haven't gone away. They're obviously infecting and lysing something, and they're oscillating. But the host is flat. We often look for predator prey relationships in time series data by looking for these quarter phase shifted peaks, but you don't see it at all here. And so what Zisha said is exactly what happened, and that's thankfully my next slide. An experiment that they did a few years later where they actually put in, uh, the, they marked or able to resolve the, the different types of hosts using, uh, using markers, and then measure resistant hosts and susceptible hosts. And what you see is that the resistant hosts grow to their, not exactly carrying capacity because there was a trade off, but the susceptible hosts and viruses are now doing a lockable paradynamic, but it was below resolution. Right? So here, you don't see the oscillations in the host because the hosts that are going up and down are at least a log scale density below that of the resistant hopes. And that's why you get something called cryptic dynamics. Dynamics are happening, but they're hard to see. So to sum up this section, there's this notion going back into the 20s and 30s of lockable paradynamics, classic predator prey dynamics. Right? That then in the 1990s, and Bohan and Lenski are two of the folks who did this, also uh, Nelson Hairston, Steve Elmer, and others, 
proposed the notion that there could be cryptic cycles when the hosts evolve. Right? When hosts evolve, meaning there are two types that are changing in frequency, the definition of evolution, the change in frequency over time. Right? When there are all these two hosts and there's host evolution, then you can get cryptic cycles. And last year, uh, Michael Cortez, who is a former postdoc on my group now, a faculty member at Utah State, and I proposed, and this was led by Michael, a notion of multi-type predator-prey dynamics when both the host and virus, or the predator and prey, evolve. So there's really co-evolution. You can get something even different, which is that the predator peak seems to precede the prey peak. So if you were looking classically, you'd say the hare eat the lynx. The hosts eat the viruses. But right? so that's not what's happening. But this is, I'm not telling you how we got it yet, but I'm just telling you if you look at the same way, you look at total virus population, total host population, total predator of prey, you get this reversal in the cycle order. Okay? So what was that model? So I just this is the result of some model, and I'll show you data in a moment. This is a model in which we have two types of viruses and two types of hosts. So there's co-evolution. There's the change in gene uh, in, in these strain frequencies over time. And there are differences, though. One virus has increased uh, ability to infect and lyse both types. One has a decreased ability. So one's the better competitor, but there's a trade-off. And likewise, one host is more susceptible than the other, but there's also a trade-off in terms of growth. And if you do the dynamics arising from this model, meaning classic loss of Volterra dynamics, but with multiple types, and I look at viruses and hosts, I get the virus peak followed by the host peak, right? When the viruses are most abundant, the next thing that happens is that hosts become abundant. But if you look underneath, and it's a little complicated here, there are these other strain dynamics, meaning the strains are not staying at the same relative frequencies. And that turns out to be the explanation. So I'm going to move into this strange kind of what I call a phase uh, plane, which just is I'm going to plot the total prey on the x-axis and the total predators, host viruses, and so the arrows denote, if we were just tracking their densities, this is how the dynamics would proceed. Okay? Meaning we have a lot of prey, and the next thing we do is go this way. When we have most, the most number of predators, usually in a lockable terror sense, the prey would decrease. But no, in this case, they increase. Okay? So the case of the, and it's really useful starting up here, at this point, we have the most abundant predator population, but yet somehow this is when it seems most advantageous for prey, the opposite of the canonical lock of Volterra dynamics. And it turns out if you analyze these models, there's a broad class of models where the following feature occurs. Where at this point, these are now the prey, the host, the predators. So at this point where they're the most predators, they're in fact low offense predators, meaning they're that other viral type that are dominating. Yet, these are high vulnerability hosts. But if there's a switch in relative frequency now to low vulnerability hosts, they're able to grow rapidly because they're not infected by these low offense viruses. Okay? And so it's the switch in the relative frequency, and I won't, again, this is quite, it gets a little bit complicated going through all the steps, but I think that's the key step. And it's really that the composition of the community has changed. There's a co evolution. In the, so the, the change in the relative frequency of both hosts and viruses that allow it to have an effect on the ecology. We think about ecology mean total populations. How do the populations change? We're seeing different ecological dynamics as a result of co-evolutionary dynamics. And that's the, the sum up. That these clockwise or reverse population cycles, where it looks like, again, hair eating leaves, hosts eating viruses, are happening precisely because there's this latent, which originally wasn't seen, and then obviously you can do markers and look at it, there's co dynamics taking place. So do we observe these in, in phase bacteria data sets? The, the advantage, uh, at least in working in the viral host world, is that time series data is often available in places that in other circumstances might not be. So I'm again going to turn to Bruce Levin, who did an experimental study of, of vibrio cholera and phages that infected in chemostats. And this was uh, from a few years ago. I think this had a few papers, both in 2010 and 11. One in uh, Christine's Royal Society, another uh, in American Naturalist. And again, I'm using the red for viruses and blue for hosts. And it's hard to pick out with your eye just now, so I want to highlight four sections. And I think you should start to see if I stand right here. Here's virus peak followed by host, virus peak, host, virus, host, virus, host. Okay? The opposite, seemingly, of what we'd expect if this were really lockable paradynamics. We can also put it into the same phase plane where I plot the log of bacteria, log of viruses, and there's this orientation 
as opposed to the other way around. Rockable Terra goes counterclockwise, which we, we all teach, right, in ecology, right? We've been teaching it for years. You could say we've been teaching it for 80 years. But once you have multiple types in a population, you can actually have a very different effect, meaning the numbers of hosts and viruses can have a totally opposite signature of what you'd expect from classic rock level terror dynamics. So to sum up this part, there's a long body of theory with many changes in terms of functional responses and so on, that when you have a player and prey interacting, you get these canonical quarter phase cycles where first you have the prey peak and then the predator peaks. But when the hosts evolve, you can get things like cryptic dynamics where it looks like the predator, in this case the virus, is oscillating even if the host population is apparently staying flat. And when you have co-evolution, you can get reversals of cycles. And this is, this is interesting, but we're still limiting ourselves to one or two or three types, right? So that's why I want to go in, in my last few minutes here to think a little bit about where we're going as a group uh, in terms of the interplay between ecological and evolutionary dynamics from the specific environment, the marine environment and the marine surface. So, as I mentioned before, I think the, the sort of revival of, of, let's say, viral ecology, uh, let's say, modern viral ecology in the marine environment begins, in some sense, with Berg. There were many other people around that some time, but this Berg et al. paper suggested, well, we should really think about the ecological role of viruses. They're not a, they may not be minor players here. And since that time, each dot represents a sample site in which data on total virus abundance, largely in surface waters, were taken over the past 25 years. This is uh, an agglomeration of, of data uh, that, that others have collected, but that we aggregated as, as part of a ocean viral variants working group that I co-organized with Steve Wilhelm at the National Institute for Math Biosynthesis in, in Knoxville. And there's around 6,000 of these points. You'll see that uh, there's some oceanographers in the group that tend to be seasonal effects, like you don't go out into places that are not so nice in wintertime. And anyway, they're, they're on transects. It's still a lot of, a lot of work, and, but it's still obvious that we're missing large swaths of the ocean. But we, we do have some, uh, some data and some patterns already come out. So this is the relationship between total virus counts, total bacterial counts, and you see it's not exactly one to one. These are log scale. There may be some curvature here. They're color coded with depth. So this also points out that even 1,000 meters below the surface, you're still getting significant viral and bacterial counts in the water column. And up near the surface, you're getting counts up to 10 to the 8th per mil and above. Typical numbers tend to be around 5 times 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 7th per mil of virus. And bacteria, as a rule of thumb, are about 5 or 10 fold below that. So there are a lot of bacteria and viruses out there. And if we think about what we learned from our network study, is that we imagine that all of these viruses are not infecting all the bacteria, that there's some network of relationship between them. The problem is that all of this data, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the work that Cesar Flores did in, in Lauren Park's relative contribution. I think we've done a lot here to say, look, the, comp the, the structure of these virus host communities are not all mass action, that there's, there are connections between them. But all of this data, every single little bit of this data, required a cultured isolate, both of the host and the virus. And so then, yeah, as reviewers had told us in our first effort to publish this paper, which we eventually got through, because that's all the data that there was, the question was still, what about the uncultured bacterial virus? How do you know what the relationships are going to be? So I just want to make one last highlight. This is coming out in Nature this week. I was a, did a small contribution to this project. It was led by Matt Sullivan, uh, where I did uh, my sabbatical this past year. They developed a technique called viral tagging, in which essentially they take an environmental virus community, apply a fluorescent dye, and then mix it with a bait host. Right? This bait host has been isotopically labeled, so its DNA is heavy relative to the light DNA of the viruses. They separate out any cell that's fluorescently tagged on a flow cytometer. So now they have their hosts that have been infected. And then they separate the viral DNA from the host DNA using the light heavy uh, distinguish, uh, distinguishing characteristics so that they can then sequence all of the viral DNA, so essentially all the viruses that infected this bait host, even without ever bringing it into culture. And so this is uh, one such plot where now this is a kind of a projection of the diversity, and it gets a little bit complicated to explain exactly these coordinate axes. Uh, but in essence, it tries to project how different the viruses are to a set of core viruses that we know about. Right? And the point here is that there's a lot of new viruses that we've never even seen before 
but now we can relate, and we always knew that from biomedigenomics, but now we can actually figure out who are you infecting? Who's your partner in the community? And obviously, this is just one step. This, in some sense, is one row right, in these networks. We haven't done the, you need to do the same thing for the column, say, if I can take this great virus and, and fish out the uncultured host, you begin to see how we might be able to think about networks and even dynamics, and that's I hope like what we're going to be doing in the next three to five years. So with that, I'll finish up to point out a number of people who contributed here. Cesar Flores, a recent graduate uh, in physics, Luis Colbert, also in physics who did a lot of the dynamic works. Uh, Michael Cortez, who did, really led this theory of uh, reverse cycles, um, and that PNAS paper is now faculty at Utah State. A number of collaborators uh, are funding sources, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks.